Joseph, somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean, 1939. Eleven days from home. Joseph's mother grabbed for his father's flailing arms, but Aaron was too strong for her, thin as he was. No, no, they're coming for us, he said, his eyes frantic. The ship is slowing down. Can't you feel it? We're slowing so they can turn us around, take us back to Germany. Joseph's father pulled his arm away and knocked over a lamp. It fell to the floor with a crash, and the light went out. Joseph, help me, his mother begged. Joseph pulled himself away from the wall and tried to grab one of his father's arms while his mother went for the other. In the corner of her bed, Ruthie buried her face in Bitsy's ears and cried. No, Joseph's father cried. We have to hide. Do you hear me? We cannot stay here. We have to get off the ship. Joseph grabbed his father's arm and held on tight. No, Papa, we're not turning around, Joseph said. We're slowing for a funeral, a funeral at sea. Joseph's father stopped dead, but Joseph kept a tight hold on him. He hadn't wanted to tell his father about the funeral, but now it seemed to be the only way to calm him down. Aaron, Aaron's bulging, haunted eyes swept to his son. A funeral? Who died? A passenger? It was the Nazis who did it. I knew they were on board. They're after all of us. He began to thrash again, more panicked than before. No, Papa, no, Joseph said. He fought to hold on to his father. It was an old man, Professor Wheeler. He was sick when he came on board. He, it's not the Nazis, Papa. Joseph knew all about it. Ruthie had begged him to go swimming in the pool with her and Renata and Evelyn that afternoon. But Joseph was a man now, not a boy. He was too old for kid stuff. He'd been walking the outside boardwalk on B-deck instead, keeping an eye out for a man from the engine room, Scheindick, and his friends when he heard a cry from one of the cabin portholes. Peeking inside, he saw a woman with long, curly black hair in a white dress sobbing as she lay across the body of an old man. Captain Schroeder and the ship's doctor were there too. The man in the bed was perfectly still, his mouth open and his eyes staring blankly at the ceiling. He was dead. Joseph had never seen a dead body before. You there, boy! Joseph had jumped. A woman walking her little dog on the boardwalk on B-deck had caught him peeping. He had sprinted away as the little dog barked at him, but not before Joseph heard the ship's doctor say that Professor Wheeler had died of cancer. In his family's cabin now, a few hours later, Joseph still clung to his father's arm, trying to calm him down. He was an old man. He had been sick for a long time already, Joseph told his father. They're burying him at sea because we're too far away from Cuba. Joseph and his mother hung on to his father until Joseph's word finally got through. Papa stopped struggling against them and sagged, and suddenly they were holding him up off the floor. He was sick already? Papa asked. Yes, it was cancer, Joseph said. Joseph's father let them guide him to his bed, where he sat down. Mama went to Ruthie to comfort her. When is the funeral? Papa asked. Late tonight, Joseph responded. I want to go, his father said. Joseph couldn't believe it. Papa hadn't left the cabin in 11 days, and now he wanted to go to the funeral of someone he had never met. In his condition, Joseph looked worried to his mother, who held Ruthie in her lap. I don't think that's such a good idea, Mama said echoing Joseph's thoughts. I saw too many men die without funerals, Papa said. I will go to this one. It was the first time his father had ever spoken of a place that he had been, when it was like a winter frost covering everything in the room. It ended the conversations as quickly as it begun. Take Joseph with you, then, Mama said. Ruthie and I will stay here. That night, 
Joseph led his father to a deck aft, where the captain and his first officers waited with a few other passengers. The passengers' clothes looked shabby, and it was only when he heard his father tearing his shirt that Joseph understood. Ripping your garments was a Jewish tradition at funerals, and they had torn theirs, theirs in sympathy with, with Miss Wheeler. Joseph pulled on his own collar until the seam ripped, and his father nodded and led him to the sandbox by the pool and had taken a handful of sand. Joseph didn't understand, but he did as he was told. The elevator to A deck arrived, and Miss Wheeler emerged, emerged first, a candle in hand. Behind her came the rabbi and four sailors who carried Professor Wheeler's body on a stretcher. He was bound up tight in a white sailcloth like an Egyptian pharaoh. Hold on there, a man from below decks. Scheindick pulled through a small crowd with two fellow crew, crew members. I'm Otto Scheindick, the Nazi's party leader on this ship, he said. And the German law states that a body buried at sea must be covered with the national flag. Scheindick unfurled the red and white Nazi flag with the black swastika in the middle, and the passengers gasped. Papa pushed his way forward. Never! Do you hear me? Never. It is sacrilege. He was shaking worse than ever. Joseph had never seen his father this angry, and he was frightened for him. Scheindig wasn't the kind of man you wanted to mess with. Joseph grabbed his father's arm and tried to pull him away. Papa spat at the feet of Scheindig. That is what I think of you and your flag. Scheindick and his men surged forward to avenge the insult, but Captain Schroeder quickly intervened. Stop this! Stop this at once, steward! The Captain Schroeder commanded. Scheindick addressed his captain, but never took his eyes off Joseph's father. It's German law, and I say no reason for an exception to be made in this case. And I do, Captain Schroeder said. Now, Take the flag and leave here, Mr. Scheindick, or I will relieve you of your duty and have you confined to your quarters. The steward held Papa's gaze for a long moment more. His eyes shifted to Joseph, giving him goosebumps, and Scheindick turned and stormed away. Joseph's chest heaved like he had been running a marathon. He was so wound up, he was quivering worse than his father. Slant, sand slipped from his shaking fist. The captain apologized profusely for the disturbance, and the funeral continued. The rabbi said a short prayer in Hebrew, and the sailors slid the body of Professor Wheeler over the side of the ship. After a moment, there was a quiet splash, and the mourners said together, Remember, God, that we are of dust. One by one, they stepped to the rail where they released handfuls of sand, the sand Joseph's father had told, told him to take from the sandbox. Joseph joined his father at the rail, and they scattered the sand to the sea. Captain Schroeder and his first officers put their caps back on and saluted. They touched the brims of their hats, Joseph noticed, instead of giving the Hitler salute. Without words, the funeral service broke up. Joseph expected his father to return to their cabin right away, but instead he lingered at the rail, staring down into the dark waters of the Atlantic. What was he thinking? Joseph wondered. What happened to him at Dashu that he's now a ghost of the man he once was? At least he didn't have to be buried in the hell of the Third Reich his father said. The ship rumbled softly, and Joseph knew the captain had restarted the engines, and they were on their way to Cuba again. But how much time had they lost?